Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Catholics at Home podcast. Uh, after a short break that we all took uh, last week, uh, welcome back to another episode on this Saturday morning where we bring you different topics of conversation, uh, life issues, church-related issues. Uh, and we hope that you've been enjoying uh, our conversations uh, over these two years uh, since we started this podcast uh, so if you are joining us, wherever you're joining us from, uh, whether you are joining us, uh, you know, uh, from here in, in KL or in different cities in, in, in Malaysia or even outside of Malaysia, welcome once again uh, to our weekly podcast. Now, this podcast comes to you uh, live uh, from our home, home studios. Uh, that's why it's called Catholics at Home. And it gives you the convenience of sitting at home without going to any particular place uh, to somehow eavesdrop, uh, to take part, to engage in a conversation with us, uh, with our speakers, uh, with our guests that we bring in, uh, to able to enlighten us, to help us to understand better the church, uh, the life of the church, the ministry, our country, 
and everything, uh, everything and anything that is related to life uh, is a conversation that we bring. So don't forget to, to share, subscribe, uh, invite your friends uh, to watch us this morning or to watch all our previous episodes uh, where you can find them on Facebook, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, you can also find us on Spotify. Of course, not the video, but the audio conversations. Uh, you can find us at Spotify. Just look for Catholics at Home. Uh, and do share with your friends. Uh, tell them to, to like, to subscribe, because every time when we post uh, a new episode, you will get a reminder. So in that way, you will not forget to join us every Saturday morning. For those of you who have been following us uh, every week, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, it's very heartening you know, when I meet people and they say, oh, we, we've been listening to Catholics at home and we have found it very interesting. Uh, we hope to keep it that way. We hope to keep it going and to bring you in interesting conversations so that your Saturday morning uh, with a cup of coffee, you are able to join us and to listen to these interesting conversations that help widen our perspectives about faith, about spirituality uh, and about life. So if you haven't done it already, please press that subscribe button or that like button or follow button uh, and also invite your friends to join us uh, in this conversation. And so this morning, uh, this morning we are we are talking about a process that the church has been taking, and uh, many of you have heard about the synodal process being announced in our churches. You are seeing it uh, on on virtual uh, media, uh, on online media. Uh, we have been talking about you know Pope Francis inviting us on this two year journey. Some of you have been involved in it. Uh, in doing the, 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 the questionnaire that was sent out by the different dioceses, different parishes, different ministries. There's this whole movement within the church uh, since last year trying to bring about this synodal process which the Holy Father is inviting us to. Now, we may have heard this. We may have heard this being preached. We may have heard this being announced. But sometimes, you know, these words like synod, synodal, uh, what does it mean? We had this conversation some time ago uh, with Bishop Sebastian Francis about the synod process. Uh, and if you haven't uh, listened to that, do go look back into our, our Facebook or YouTube streams. Uh, you will find that conversation, that initial conversation with Bishop Sebastian Francis, the Bishop of Penang, uh, about the synodal process. But today, today after we have come a long way uh, and haven't started the process, haven't compiled the the, the feedback, uh, the answers, uh, and kind of collated it. Uh, this morning, uh, we have Father Mitchell uh, Anthony with us, uh, who has been very important in this process here in the Archdiocese of Kuala Lumpur, integral to it. Uh, he has been spearheading it. So we want to talk to him a little bit about the whole process that has that has taken place. Uh, we also want to find out a little bit about you know what has happened since then and what is going to happen uh, now that all these things have, have been taken, all these things have been recorded, summarized, and how are these things going to be implemented? How our voices are going to be heard? Uh, this is the question many people are asking. So uh, do, do, do stay with us uh, till the end of this conversation uh, and to get an idea of whole, this whole process that we are in. And so uh, I'd like, just like to invite uh, uh, Father Mitchell uh, Anthony to join us in this conversation this morning. Uh, good morning, Father Mitchell. Good morning, Father Clarence. Good morning. Thank uh, you for calling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for taking time off uh, on this Saturday morning. I know, you know, weekends are really a busy time uh, in the parishes uh, to take this time to have this conversation uh, with our viewers who have been faithfully following and those who have been involved in this synodal process. Uh, just to find out a little bit where are we at this current time? Uh, what are some of the findings? Uh, you know, what are some of the hopes and aspirations uh, of you and, and your team? But but before we, we get into that conversation for, for the benefit of our viewers here, perhaps you would like to introduce us a very brief introduction. You know, uh, many of you have seen you, many of you have heard you, but a little bit about yourself. Where do you come from? And, you know, whatever you'd like to share with our viewers this morning. Yeah, sure. I'll be glad to. Uh, originally, I'm from uh, Kedah. I was born, I, was, I grew up in Kedah. Then I was trans my dad was transferred to KL. Then we moved to KL. We were in Klang. And from Klang uh, is where I joined the seminary. Uh, joined the seminary for a few years, then became a priest. Then I was sent to Rome to study ecclesiology, dogmatic theology, and uh, was sent to several parishes, had great experience uh, teaching the seminary, 
also experience in the rural areas and the town areas. And now I'm here with you all. <laughs> so now, now you are based in the Church of the Good Shepherd uh, in Stapak. Um, yes. And you mentioned that you, you taught ecclesiology. Now, that is a mouthful uh, mm -hmm. to help, help our viewers understand. What is this ecclesiology that you studied and you teach? Uh, basically, ecclesiology means the church. What is the church? And how has the church evolved over the years? And what is the church today? You know, and how has it been growing fruitfully? And so, uh, Father Mitchell, I, as you said, that it, it's about the study of the church. And so you are the right person to talk to a little bit about this uh, synodal process, the synodal church uh, that the Holy Father uh, has called. And you have been uh, very involved uh, in the Archdiocese uh, and I'm sure also at the national level. But before we jump into some of the findings, just to ask you, you know, Pope Francis started this, this two-year synodal process, okay? Synods are not very, I mean, not something new in the church. We've had many synods in the church, but the synodal process uh, uh, seems to be something very new. Can you just tell us briefly, you know, what, what are the different stages uh, in this process? Yeah, in this uh, synodal, the, the difference is this. The Pope wants the whole church to be involved. This is what synodality is all about, journeying together. All of us have a voice to speak. We all have to listen to each other. And to achieve this, the, the process involves three stages. One is the diocesan stage. And in this stage, the objective is the consultation of the people of God at all levels, from the parish, diocesan ministries, and the religious. That's the first stage. Then the second stage is the continental stage. And the objective is to promote dialogue at the continental level, about the about the text text of the working peer documents and deepen the discernment within the specific cultural context of each continent. That's the second stage, and the third stage is of course the universal stage. This is the the synod of bishops will take place in Rome in October twenty twenty three. The three stages here. So when you speak of these three stages, uh, the first stage is the diocesan stage uh, and uh, there is consultation. So many of our viewers probably had taken part uh, in, the, in the questionnaires that were, that were sent out. Different dioceses uh, applied, approached it in different ways. Uh, one of the things for the Mitchell is that just listening and, and seeing the whole process, this is not something new for us, isn't it? Uh, from, from the time of, you know, aggiornamento, <laughs> Talking about consultation uh, and something that something that we have been quite accustomed to. So, what is different this time for the Mitchell? Uh, if you ask me, it is right from 1976. We have been journeying with PMPC over every ten years, and within the diocese itself, we have been having upper meetings. Uh, even at the parish level, we had parish assemblies. We have been collecting tremendous amount of uh, data findings. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not something that is new, but uh, the emphasis in the synodal approach is to make sure that everybody is involved, to get, make sure that everyone, especially those at the peripheries, the marginal people, to listen to them, not only just church center, also the, the whole peri periphery. So, yeah. so in terms of in terms of those stages that we are that we are moving along here in the archdiocese. Um, which stage are we in at this time? Yeah, we are actually towards the end of the first stage, the diocesan stage. Uh, <clears throat> last month, June June eighteenth, we had the priest nodal gathering for the Archdiocese of Kuala Lumpur. About two hundred participants were present. Here, the objective was to finalize the findings. We were able to summarize the whole. I think there were. 22 or 25,000 over findings, responses, we collected it and then we summarized it to 10 pages. And this was presented during the assembly, the 10 pages. And after that, we had workshops wanting people whether they want to add on any other feedbacks if they want. And we collected those feedbacks as well. And what will happen next is we will again gather all this information to the 10 pages and submit, it, submit these documents at the national level that will be held uh, next week. So we're actually towards the end of the first stage. 
So if we, we are coming to if you are coming to the end of, of the first stage of, of consultation, uh, just from your own experience uh, of having you said twenty thousand respondents or uh, responses, responses, responses. Yeah. So we, we have had you know people from all walks of life uh, coming, uh, and for you personally, I'm sure you have been involved in looking at some of those responses that have come in. Uh, how is that? whole consultation been for you i mean as a priest having gone through that process if you ask me personally the findings or the responses that we find for the diocese of kuala lumpur uh, specifically uh, i see the same thing happening the same responses that was said before it's been repeated quite often issues about the youths issues about family life it is the same thing that is reoccurring again and again yes so that seems to be you know the, the preoccupation of of most of our our catholics uh, and also I, I guess uh you know in society uh, about the future of, of young people uh, about the family dynamics that's being challenged today in, in so many different ways uh if i were to ask you if i would ask you you know uh if you could name three three key points that that we were you were able you or your team were able to to appropriate from all these i know it's, it's a difficult thing you have twenty thousand responses and how do you actually you know summarize them it, in itself is it, it's quite challenging isn't it uh and to yeah. trying to put together uh, personally for you i mean personally for you apart from what has been put together what, what are the three key findings that, that that somehow perhaps uh either surprised you or or maybe it didn't surprise you or something that you expected uh in in this process of consultation and there's something that maybe we as church uh, need to pay attention to would that would that be three i'm sure there are many but if i would ask you what were the top three things that that you know that caught your eye uh in this process yeah i'm not only looking at the synodal process i'm also going back right from the 1970s from where vatican II started and the struggle that was uh, began from Vatican II until now. And uh, I can generally speak about three very important aspects of the church that needs, const uh, needs uh, urgent attention. All right. Uh, the first one, which I've been hearing quite often over the years, uh, is that we need to move from a, from a clergy-centric church to a more people-oriented church or Christ-oriented church, sorry, from people to Christ-centered churches, Christ-centered communities. It's, we, even in the synodal process, we see a lot of tension between the priests and the clergy. It's because priests and the laity, it's because everybody is now still still holding on to the priests around the priest. You know, so it's still there. This is the first first thing I realized. That we need to move on move forward the second aspect uh, that seems to be coming quite often is that that we have to move from being so exclusive to a more inclusive church as, as when i say exclusive means uh, being very selective in the churches you know uh, sometimes we in the church you know it is it's a common trend a common thing uh, we tend to hold on to individuals who can do the job fast for us, you know, and then we rely a lot from them. And then this gives a different picture to the whole other, uh, the rest of the community. Why is Father always following this group of people? Basically because this group of people are the ones that are doing the job well and they are committed, you know. So sometimes this is again a, a struggle. How do we move from being more to move towards the more inclusive, trying to get everybody involved in our whole project, activities in the church, in the discernment process, and all that. You know. That's the second one. The third one is, uh, sometimes we get caught up with task-orientated. We are so task-orientated. Uh, we have activities after activities, and we are good. We are good. We do it very well. Every activity is done very well. We spend lots of money. A lot of people are involved in it but is it helping the person is the person are we person oriented is it helping the person to grow in faith is the relationship between one another growing 
because in the synodal the, there's always the issue of uh, relationship between each other, leaders and the uh, others, uh, relationship between priests and people. You know, maybe we are not people oriented. We are less people oriented together. You know? So these three areas, like Clarence, I think uh, we can relook. Yeah. So, so as I as I hear you, uh, you talk you talk about you know a Christ centered church or Christ centered community. Uh, we need to move towards that. Otherwise. The church is is built on 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 personalities on on you know on individuals and then I think you know that's why sometimes you know when I mean more recently when we all had to move from parish to parish you know people start comparing this priest is like this this priest is like that it becomes too uh, centered around the priest and then if this priest is here people will start coming back or this priest is not here I you know this priest comes right. here I'm going to move out so. I think that's an important point you, that you mentioned. Uh, it cannot be centered on the priests, uh, or even in that sense, uh, a community. But it has to be a Christ-centered community, not just yes. just not just an ordinary community. I think the importance of Christ. I think the second thing that you mentioned that you know, really, I think it's being inclusive, and I think that's where I think we we need to move towards today. today I mean, in the past. We, in, even within the church, uh, I mean, leave aside different exclusive groups. Sometimes we are divided by, by language groups in our own parishes. Yeah. You know, uh, I am yeah. this language group, I am that language group, and I am this language. And then they don't mix with each other. Uh, right. And we all say that we are one parish, isn't it? We are one community, yeah. we are one parish. Uh, and the moment when you have a community mass, uh, some people say, oh, yeah, I'm not coming. Like, you know, I, I don't understand the language. I don't know whether you, you face that because you have, a, a, you have all four languages in your parish, isn't it? Correct, uh, correct. So back, back every every Sunday, yeah. And I mean, a lot of us are, are multilingual in our parishes, uh, and so, yeah. sometimes we can be one community, but yet an exclusive community because we divide ourselves among the language groups. Yeah, and the third one is is we become too task oriented. I think rightly you put too focused on the task. Uh, we have meetings after meetings, isn't it? You know, planning, evaluation. You know, uh, we forget. I guess what you were trying to say, we forget the spiritual dimension of it, people's growth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, three, very three key points that, that you talk about uh, in terms of moving towards. Now, just coming back a little bit uh, for the Mitchell to this whole process. Now, trying to, trying to understand, uh, you know, Pope Francis has been trying to move this church uh, in, in a particular way uh, in a process. Um, and this whole idea of consultation, this idea of, of inclusiveness uh, that, that we need in church. You know, without, without really, you know, he, you know, many people are expecting him to, to change the doctrine of the church, but he's not, but he's trying to find ways how to include people and not exclude them uh, in that sense. Um, fr from your study of ecclesiology through the years, you have different popes. Uh, how, would you, how would you define or characterize this pope's mindset? This Pope, his mind or his ecclesiology, if I can say, draw it from all the documents that I read from him, like the Evangelii Gaudium and all the other rest of the documents, his mind and heart is seems to be he seems to be more concerned to the people who are vulnerable, the peripheries, the marginalized, the weak, the bruised. And his image of the church, I'm sure we, we all know this, he has always indicated the image of the church as a field hospital. That itself says, you know, what, what, what kind of church is he talking about? Uh, the smelling of the sheep. All this speaks about a Pope who is inclusive and, and calls for a different church, a different church in the sense that it is welcoming, it is inclusive, it is, it is also something that it never leaves anyone behind. Never leaves anyone behind. And if you look at the recent appointment of cardinals that he has done, also tells us, you know, he has taken a lot of cardinals from peripheries already, smaller, smaller nations. Uh, he has taken people from smaller nations to become cardinals, to be with him at the uh, office. So this, uh, this speaks about himself, an inclusive pope. 
Yeah, I think his his concerns are very real. I think he said eventually Gaudium. He talks about Amoris Laetitia. You know, you talk you talk about the creation, uh, Laudato Si, and more recently, but Fratelli Tutti. You know that we are all brothers. We are all brothers and sisters, uh, journeying together. Uh, I think he, like you mentioned, he has been trying. He's been trying to be inclusive of everyone, uh, and. And yet, some people choose to exclude themselves, isn't it? Uh, in many ways, and, and you know, more recently, he's been talking about what Vatican II. But you know, and I think he had been uh, in, during that period of Vatican II uh, involved in that process of of, of talking about it. Um, and and he keeps going back to to what Vatican II has brought out. And 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 you rightly know that the model of the church prior to Vatican is quite different from the model of the church uh, post-Vatican. You know, the two main documents that we often study, in the, when we have to study in the seminary, is one is, is Lumen Gentium. It's basically, that's the core document and the church in the modern world, uh, Gaudium et Spes. Uh, but, yet, but yet, Pope Francis faces these, it seems for us, you know, it's the way forward. But yet, you know, there's always these roadblocks for him. Uh, uh, there are people very critical of him. Uh, why, why do you think, I mean, from your own reading and understanding, why, why do you think that this is kind of resistance towards these changes uh, that for most people, it's the right way to move forward as a church, as you keep mentioning also? Yeah, very good uh, observation there. Because we know before Vatican II and after Vatican II, even in our local context, we had a lot of resistance in our parishes. When priests were so convinced of uh, Vatican II, they came back, they were removing few statues and all that, trying to change the structure of the church, the, the position of the priests, now facing the congregation. There were lots of resistance within us, within the local church itself, you know. So I would say that, you know, but is resistance necessary? To go forward i think it is necessary it is inevitable because resistance you will have residues there will be residues will still linger on you see? but there will be a time it will go off slowly but you know as you say change is very difficult even in my own parish i want to change this community's mindset it's so difficult if you say i got four four tamils uh, four language group tomorrow if i say i'll have one mass i'm gone you know, people will not simply accept it. Therefore, I don't uh, blame the people, but I think change needs time. And to change, to go move forward, we cannot change it overnight, but we need more popes like St. Francis to continue this journey. You know, as long as we don't go backwards, as long as we are moving, as you said, no, put two steps in front, one step at the back. We move two steps in front, one step at the back. As long as you're moving forward, we are okay. Uh, resistance is, you said, is inevitable for every change. Uh, even in in the Bible, when, when the Lord asked the different prophets to go to different places, they said, "Oh no, no, I cannot." You know, so there's there's I, I guess there's this process of conversion. Uh, there's you know between change, resistance, uh, and what kind of links the two together is a process of conversion that that is needed uh, in each one of us and. For that conversion to happen, uh, there must be some level of openness. Uh, because change for anyone, I always say this, change for anyone is, is very difficult, even for a little child. You know, you, you change the routine, everything gets, everything goes a little bit haywire, even for the older people, even for us. You know, recently we have to move parishes, you know, change. Uh, it's, yes, we go in obedience, but as you grow older, you begin to realize it's not so, it's not so easy, isn't it? Uh, to, right, to, yeah. to move from one place to another. After six years, when you kind of settle down a little bit, okay, right, time to move again. Okay, so you start scratching your head now. I, I to move again and shift all these things. There's a certain level of comfort uh, that things bring about over time. But this, I mean, this has been the, the 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 development of the church, isn't it? I mean, you from from the beginning, uh, from the uh, from the church fathers. Uh, how the church has evolved to what it is today. Uh, it has gone through a process of change. It has gone through a process of going backwards sometimes, uh, and then it goes forward again. It's a little bit like the pendulum, isn't it? I mean, you you yeah. you, you move, 
you go backwards, you move. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember in the seminary, one of the books, I mean, you and I had the same professor for, for ecclesiology, uh, the late Father Moses Louis, uh, who taught us, uh, God rest his soul. Uh, you know, the, one of the famous book was Avery Dulles's Models of the Church, isn't it? I mean, how many models? I forgot, like eight models huh? or seven models, uh, yep. <laughs> seven models of, of the church. And, and it kind of, it doesn't say that we are in one particular model. We can be a little bit of each. We can be a little bit of each. But, you know, from your own study, from your own teaching, from your own experience in that sense, the world is changing rapidly, isn't it? You know, and... And people are asking the question about the relevance of church. You know, is the church relevant? Is young people are asking, is is faith relevant today? Uh, and and now after during after the pandemic, people are asking the question: uh, Is going to church relevant? You know, uh, going back to a physical church. I don't know whether you you, you hear that. Uh, people are asking, oh, well, I, I can do it online. What I mean, it's okay. After all, I mean, I'm still I'm still there. I'm still making time for God. Uh, but moving forward. With this whole process of the synod, consultation, dialogue, uh, communion, participation, and mission. I think these are the three key words, isn't it? I mean, the whole theme of the synod. Uh, what kind of, if I were to ask you, what kind of a model of church do we need? Now, if you were to add to Avery Dallas's models, uh, what kind of a model of church do we need going forward? Yeah, I will, uh, if I follow Avery Dallas' model, I will use the communion of communities. Communion of communities is because that's what synodal is. The baptized Catholics each have a voice, census fidelium, that each uh, the, the sense of the faithful is very important. And the community that we are building or growing should become a welcoming community, a more inclusive community. Uh, as I said, uh, the church today, we we should have more younger people, younger mindsets, uh, younger uh, women, uh, people who are uh, professionals in the field to be part of the whole church to move on. You know, uh, we cannot have uh, the old mindsets to continue. They can contribute in their own way, but the ones who should take the leadership should be the young young ones if you want to see relevancy la. if you want to see the church as relevant today it is like young people thinking for younger people young people you know where they are able to see what the needs are if you ask me personally at this age of my i'm already 60 plus i'm going to be 70 by when i finish this parish you know now i do not know what's in the mind of the young people the gap is too great for me but if i allow them to take leadership in the church then I can see their mind becoming relevant to the church. So we need young blood to take, we have to empower people from the younger side. But, but the constant tension is this, isn't it? The constant tension seems to be when you have younger people and, and the older people say they don't have the experience. Uh, you know, they don't have the experience. Secondly is, oh, young people are not committed. You know, they're not committed like us. Uh, so perhaps sometimes you, so there's always this tension uh, that you, uh, and, uh, but does that also include that, you know, the ability and the humility to say that, yes, they will make mistakes. Uh, we will, we will accept it and, and we will learn from those mistakes. Would, would that be part of that process of, of empowering the young, empowering others to, to take leadership roles uh, in the life of the church? And, and actually, how do you see this in the life of a parish? In some practical ways, Father Mitchell. Uh, how do you see this, you know, being lived out in, in, a, in a parish? So yeah, it's, it's, if, you, uh, if, you, if you ask me as a priest, you know, even when I started as a priest, I was a young priest. And I did lots of mistakes. And there were, were elderly priests with me, you know. But eventually, the we moved on. Okay? So the same way, uh, in the parish, in the parish, we have a lot of young, uh, energized uh, young people who are able to give a lot of their time, a lot of their energy, a lot of their ideas. And it's uh, how do we incorporate them into the life of the parish? But we also must take note not to leave out the elderly. They are also important for the parish. But may, perhaps we, the, the elderly, we have to slow down. 
to let the younger ones to take more more responsibilities in the parish. As you yeah, said, I, I again, uh, understand. Letting go is not easy either. Just like change for some people, you know. Uh, some people I know that you know have been in ministry so much that they become part of the architecture of the church. They become an institution in themselves, uh, and not letting go uh, to allow others to to come in. But I want to just take up something you said earlier. We talk about communion of communities, and I want to relate that to 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 BECs. Now you are also involved uh, in the Archdiocesan uh, uh, Basic Ecclesial Community uh, Animating Team, the BCAT team. Um, is is BEC? Do you think BEC is also part of that synodal church, a synodal process? Uh, some people say, "Oh, BECs don't work." I know BECs are all old people. You, we have heard this for how many number of years, you know, uh, and we will continue to hear this, you know, even till till Christ comes again. Uh, but is this part of that synodal process of, of building small communities around the parish uh, that sustain that gives life? To the parish yeah i think the the model can change the bc model can change from within uh perhaps the old model is not relevant that uh, today maybe a new style of bc need to to take shape like you know where it can be inclusive of every young people children involved as well uh, perhaps we are very uh, again i said too exclu exclusive bcs Maybe we need to open up a bit, be more uh, open, more uh, welcoming, you know, and more attractive. You know, uh, sometimes I always feel that the BCs are afraid to get involved, or the leaders are scared to get involved because they got extra work in the parishes. You know, so maybe that that mindset has to change. Like it's more of a spiritual gathering. It's empowering each other. Uh, growing together in the spiritual life, reading Bible, sharing the word of God, you know, uh, like the early Christians. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean, BEC is something that we can talk about, you know, in, in a whole conversation and, and, and of course, the pros and cons. Uh, and, and I think you, you, you put it quite clearly that, you know, the, the model or, or the, the operational part of the BEC perhaps can change and and how the BECs uh, are inclusive. Sometimes we become too territorial, too geographical, uh, that we exclude other people, isn't it, in some ways. Maybe maybe that's how we, we need to rethink. Uh, but it, it takes it takes a it takes a while. It takes, you know, some people are like they like it because they like the familiarity. Some people want a change, want a challenge. So trying to blend those two things uh, can can be quite quite challenging. But moving forward. Uh, we talked about this whole process that we have had, consultation, uh, asking people what they think about the church. Uh, and I, I'm curious, I, and I myself have not looked at the 20,000 responses, uh, but just listening to what has been presented. Uh, do you think that that we as church, when I say church, the people of God, uh, have we come to a level of maturity uh, to be able to to shape and direct the church in Malaysia or, or the church here in your own parish, or are we still are we still stuck with you know the little tiny squabbles you know this doesn't work that doesn't work uh, the toilets not repaired <laughs> not enough masses are we still are we still stuck there just looking at those responses or have we matured because we have gone through this process several times isn't it uh, you know from PMPC consultation from your own reading. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. You know, uh, we, when, when, whenever we have our parish assemblies, they will bring it up. They will always talk about the toilets. This is not right. That is not right. Uh, I think this is also partly because we lack formation, uh, good, solid formation, even the systematic formation uh, at different levels. You know, this is really lacking. Uh, we want. There are a lot of. Uh, good intentions, committed leaders who want to do lots of things, but the how, how to do it is missing. They want to do, but they, they want, they do not know how to do it, how to approach the situation. You know, uh, you have a liturgical chairperson who wants to, he's very committed in all areas, but she must, she or he must know what is the role of liturgy in the parish. 
you know how is how is the worship going to enhance the whole parish you know so looking beyond la uh, and uh, the findings i see is they all want something like this something more comprehensive uh, for the parishes and if you ask me where do we go from here perhaps the the, the parishes each parish can take on whatever findings they have and go beyond and see how how we can go forward not necessarily you have to finish all the 10 areas or 20 areas just focus one or two areas and make sure that people are all aware give them the right formation and move on yeah i think i think perhaps that's what that, that's what we could you know work towards uh You know, otherwise it, it becomes too overwhelming isn't it you have too many things to to work on or uh, too many things you want to change you feel so overwhelmed at the end of, at the end of the day you don't do anything uh, you're just too overwhelmed by the whole the whole situation but you you mentioned a little bit about about the early christian community the early church you know the new churches you know do you see a similarity between the early church uh, and you know the, the apostolic church and And, and the synodal process that the Holy Father is inviting us to, do you, do you see any similarities between those two? Uh, similarities, yes, and also dissimilarities. You know, uh, similarities because they are people, uh, good-hearted people, people who have good faith, strong faith. They are all there sharing, sharing together. In fact, in my WhatsApp uh, BEC groups that is uh, for the whole diocese, I get see a lot of people are sharing lots of things there. So the the spiritual nourishment is going on. Uh, what the dissimilarities is that again the collaborative ministries, the collaboration. You know how how am I linked to the bigger church? How am I linked to the whole diocese? You know how am I linked to the different activities? Or am I just my own community? Am I stuck with my own community? So that seems to be the dissimilarities. Whereas the early church. They were all together, you know. Uh, although they were all living different different groups, and the priest who comes once a year or something like that, but they were all together, you know, sharing their even they are sharing their own belongings to each one another, helping out the poor, whatever. But they were all living together in faith. You talked earlier about a welcoming community, isn't it? I mean, you, you mentioned you know we need to become a welcoming community. Can you give some examples? What can what can parishes do? To be a welcoming community, in the first place, keep the gates open, lah. <laughs> you know, you know, we 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 tend to, you know, we are too cautious, and we want to put a lot. Of, we are too. We want to prevent a lot of things from happening, and then we are actually putting people outside the gate, which is not fair. They are coming all the way from you know different parts of the. the They coming by, you know. They coming with all the jam, with all the traffic. They come there, then they just five minutes late or ten minutes late. They just have to sit, stand outside. You know, I think that's quite sad, lah. So welcome in church is to welcome them first, welcome them, and then we try to form them. You know, and uh, you know the church must be always open to everyone, lah. Yeah, I think we we went through a very difficult phase uh, in the last two years. The pandemic, you know, with all the you know the SOPs, uh, yeah, the, you know, to, to both to protect uh, the church and protect the the people, the vulnerable, uh, and and somewhat. I mean, what what has been your experience now that you brought this up? Now now that we are beginning to open up a lot more, uh, do you see people coming back or? You you think that it's it's hard to gauge that because the parishes that we are in we were not there pre pandemic so it's a little bit hard for us to gauge. But what are people saying? Are people coming back or are people staying away? Uh, in that sense, uh, here I like to in my reflection about this. Uh, there are two categories. You have the rural setting, you have the urban setting. That I'm coming from Port Klang and then coming to Good Shepherd and all that. It's it's not right in the uh, spec of the town. It's not in the urban setting itself. So what I see in the uh, outskirts is people are coming back. People are coming back because I think the key word is there's a great sense of belonging to smaller churches. You know, because it's it's they're a small group of people. 
you all belong to the church when you have a feast day everybody is there the uncle auntie you no know, everyone is there no matter where they are they all come you know so the they are all coming back to their because there's a sense of belonging whereas in the uh, city area the sense of belonging is lesser you know because they all preoccupied with so many other things they only come during that one hour and go back you see whereas in other parallel churches uh, outskirts they stay there most of the time they are they are grow they have they are youths are there their friends are there you know so here they all come back yeah the so i guess sense. there's a sense of belonging yeah you, you feel a part of the of the community you feel a part of uh, yes. of you know the, the social setup the social network uh, in in smaller uh, i mean i grew up in rawang small town you know everybody knew each other you know everybody you know it's like you know it, that's that's the center of a hive of activity uh, in in so many different ways um, now you also talked a little bit about the upcoming uh, national pre synodal assembly is that what it's called uh, we had the diocesan one now um, it's taking place uh, in penang uh, this weekend, uh, I guess you will be there also. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what what the purpose, the purpose and the aims of of this national gathering. How many people will be there? Who would be there? Uh, what is going to take place uh, for our viewers here this morning? Okay, uh, for the diocese of KL, we already finalized the ten pages summary report. Now, what's going to happen is we need to get together as a national body. That means all the conference of bishops will be there all the bishops from the different dioceses of Malaysia, they will, be, they will be there and each will present their 10 pages, their reports, their summary reports. And from that summary reports with the synodal team that was working in each place, they will also be present with our, of course, our contact person for us will be Rita Krishnan. She will be uh, guiding us there and she will be presenting our part, our 10 pages. and. Uh, from there, from 90 pages, they have to summarize it to 10 pages by the end of the day on Monday. See, and these 10 pages, once it's summarized, this will be from Malaysia, from the conference of bishops in, uh, in Malaysia. It will go off to the, the next stage, that is the continental stage. All right. Now, you talk about from our diocese, 20,000 responses, then down to 10 pages, you know, then from the 10 pages is put together into a 90 page uh, 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 project uh, and reduced further to another 10 pages. Uh, let's, let me put the question to you. What, what are your aspirations? What are your hopes? You know, having been involved in this process, you know, and a lot of people have articulated, uh, what are your hopes and aspirations? What, what would this, this whole process of moving towards being a synodal church uh, entail, or what, what does it hold for us uh, in, in the future? Yeah, okay. This synodal church is a process. It's not an event. We are not here to, uh, it's not result oriented. We already started the process by allowing people to speak and we listen. We are listening, listening. This whole process must continue, right? And uh, will will the when it goes to the final stage, you know, of bishops twenty twenty three, will they solve solve our issues here in Malaysia? I don't think so. I don't think so. It will happen because th there will be a different level altogether. We are going to see from different countries, and then uh, probably a different level will come uh, during twenty twenty three. But at for us in our stage in our diocese, what we can do is we can continue. And as you said correctly, it is not, not something new. We, have, we are so used to it from 1976 with the PFPC, with the APA, with the PPA. Probably we need to be more serious about it. And then, you know, uh, in fact, uh, whatever findings we have that is similar, I think uh, to move forward, lah, not to repeat the same thing, we need to ask this question, why? Why is this happening over and over again? The question why and then get into the root of the issue and then work on it you know i think we have to work that way rather than on a superficial level okay you need a car buy you a car you know go beyond that like go deeper than that but then, but then again isn't it i mean 
that this is the challenge of every priest in a parish and you and i will probably face the same thing and together with all our brother priests you know there are people out there who who want to change everything you know and you know there are armchair armchair critics uh, that are present everywhere you know not just in the church outside the church also politically you know socially in every aspect um if we want to bring about this this change or for example somebody may ask you know how is my voice going to be heard how is how is my contribution going to be heard uh, by the church you know and then three years down the line to say that oh i said this but nobody heard me nobody changed anything you know and then we come back to to you no know, back to to the same place where we started off um how how do you how, how do we encourage people to come forward and to be a part of that process of change because it's very easy to stand back with your, with your arms folded and say this doesn't work this doesn't work this priest not good uh, this lay leader not good how do we change that you know how do we tell people change begins uh, if you are part of that change and i think there's always a saying you know uh, if you are not part of the solution you are part of the problem isn't it <laughs> in that sense we always we always we always say that uh, how how can we i mean from your experience as a priest being involved in the parish in your in your ministries how do we encourage people to say the church is not perfect you know the church will never be perfect the church on earth is never perfect isn't it it's that is the church in in the heavenly jerusalem that is perfect how do we become part of that process uh two things lah huh? one is as you said the church is not perfect we are humans and being humans there are variety of personalities and characteristics we cannot put them all into one one shelf you know and they are, and we and each have their own rights each have their own voice to say now which voice is more important which voice is dominant which voice is not dominant again is a process you know so this things will go on just like before uh, before vatican 2 the voices were there after vatican 2 certain voices were heard and this one will go on you know uh, what the key word here is i remember monsignor james was mentioning this and i keep uh, telling this to everyone we need to go through a conversion a constant conversion the first conversion is the personal conversion of each person a personal conversion the second one is the communitarian conversion you know where the community comes first in our lives then the third conversion is the ecclesial conversion for the for like now to be an inclusive church what is it that i need to change as a person you know so this conversion must take place for for us to move forward now and 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 rightfully you say conversion because as as you were saying that i was just thinking you know yeah i mean conversion primarily is the work of the holy spirit you know who who brings about the change you know yeah if we if we think that we as humans can change things uh, you know then i i think we are short sighted uh, in that sense because by our own human effort uh, sometimes we feel we cannot change sometimes we feel that you know uh, we are hitting a a brick wall we can't move forward and i think that's where that's where we need to rely on the power of the spirit uh, the the spirit that you know we 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 always say this that in the in the response will some send forth your spirit o lord and renew the face of the earth uh, and the and the renewal the change uh, can only come from the holy spirit but but it needs our cooperation isn't it it needs human sure. human yeah. cooperation uh, in order for the spirit spirit to work uh, and sometimes we are constrained by timelines uh, we are constrained by people's expectations uh, and you say you know the conversion that at every stage whether it's community whether it's ecclesial com- conversion uh, it is to rely on on the power of the spirit uh, to move forward yeah uh for the mitchell thank you so much for for having this convers- conversation i was going to say conversion conversation with us <laughs> since we are talking about conversion uh thank you so much for for taking time to to share with us uh, this process um and, and any any last words i mean uh as we come to uh, the end of this conversation as you said this conversation can go on because the synodal process goes on um you know if you know if you are saying to your people at the end of this process in your parish you know uh, what 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 would you say to our viewers here this morning 
uh, in terms of how what needs to happen immediately for us to become a synodal church? What is the first step that we all need to take? The first step we need to take, my last uh, uh, phrase here is, we have to realize, I am the church. We are the church. We are the church together. And it's not for me just to say things, but I am part of the church, a sense of belonging as a church. And once we get the sense of belonging as church, then we can move forward. We love the church. I think a few years ago, we had this team, Centurie uh, Cum Ecclesia, you know, uh, the feel, hard look, to think and feel with the church. You know, the, to feel with the church does not mean to feel with the hierarchy. To feel with the church is the whole people of God, the baptized and the, the ordained, non-ordained, every one of us. Once we have that feeling for the church, the love for the church, I think we can move. Yeah. And I think that's that's the most important thing, to feel that you are the church. I mean, when we say the church, it's every one of us. You know, it's not just the pope, the cups, or the priests. You know, we are the church uh, um, as a community, as a people of God. And that is that is that is the spirituality of Vatican II, isn't it? The church yes. as people of God. You know, we you know it's no longer that that triangular hierarchical church, but it's a community of commun communion of communities, a church built around. Uh, and, and, and just to end, you know, and I like the whole logo of, of the synod, you know, everybody walking together and, and, and you know, the, the bishop is in the middle and is surrounded by people all around and not the bishop leading, but, you know, all walking with one another, uh, including those who are marginalized, those who are sick, uh, who are part of this synodal process. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Father Mitchell, for this interesting conversation. Uh, hopefully, you know, when we move to the next phase, we can have another conversation with you and see what comes out of the National Assembly uh, in terms of the Synod. Uh, and before we end, we, we always uh, say a prayer. Uh, could I invite you to say a, a concluding prayer for us uh, before we end our podcast this morning? Loving Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the various talents that you have given us to build this church. We thank you for the individuals who are committed, who love this church. Help us to grow in this love. Help us to feel your church as you appointed Peter to be the head of the church. You have also appointed each one of us in our own way to build this church. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. So once again, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us this morning uh, for this conversation on being a synodal church. Uh, and we look forward to having you next week, uh, same time, uh, on Catholics at Home podcast uh, for another interesting conversation uh, on a Saturday morning. Uh, till we meet again, uh, take care, uh, stay safe, uh, and have a blessed weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye.